we're going to do a little meditation, then I'm going to go into the marathon of my life. <laughs> I'm 73 years old, so there's a, it's a lot to talk about. <laughs> but um, many years ago, Mar Naples, Florida. Hi, Deborah. Toronto, Canada. Love Canada. Um, many years ago, I was at an Eckhart Tolle retreat, and he had a guest, uh, Eileen Fisher, the dressmaker. And she said that she, uh, we're up to 50 people now. She said, um, Yukon, Canada. She said that uh, at Eileen Fisher, at all their business meetings, they start, up, they start every single meeting with a, with a short meditation, which I always thought, ah. And I, ever since then, uh, I decided if I ever ran a meeting, I used to run meetings when I owned my company, um, would always start with meditations. It just makes for a much better meeting, I think. So why don't we start? I will do a, um, a little bit of a guided meditation. Those of you that have been with me during the, um, when I've subbed for R2O meetings uh, during the week, you know, you know what I do, I teach meditation. So I teach a, th a form called Vedic meditation, which is you use a mantra to, um, to uh, calm the mind, or as the Yoga Sutra says, say to um, calm the fluctuations of the mind. So why don't we, um, I'll guide you through it. If, you're, if you have a mantra, uh, then when I ask you to introduce your mantra and to repeat it, then use the mantra. If you don't, then you can use so hum, which is a generic mantra meaning I am, or sat nam, which is a Kundalini mantra. So um, I'll guide you. We'll just do like a short four or five minute meditation uh, just to, calm us and set the mood. So if you're sitting in a chair or you're sitting on a cushion or on the floor, just feel your body as you're sitting there. Feel your sit bones sit on the floor or the cushion or the chair. Try to maintain a erect spine from the sit bones all the way to the crown of the head, the back of the, of the body. Make it erect, straight. At the same time you're doing that, Imagine the front of your body being totally relaxed and open, which is a metaphor for how we meditate. We meditate into extreme, not extreme, but deep relaxation, while at the same time, uh, extremely focused. So in this stance, in this sitting stance, as you're sitting erect, move your focus to your face your forehead, just relax it, let it melt. Any contractions, any wrinkles, just let them melt. Move to your cheeks, let your cheeks melt. Let your mouth melt, your chin, just let it melt and let it relax. As you maintain the erect spine, let your shoulders drop. So you're sitting straight up, the shoulders are dropping and being relaxed at the same time. Now, as you move your focus to the to the inside of your mind and just look at your thoughts. Try not to pay any attention to what the thoughts mean, what they're telling you. Just look at the energetic quality of your thoughts. Your thoughts, besides the content, are expressions of energy. So what kind of energy are your thoughts right now? Are they loud? Are they soft? Are they disturbing? Are they soothing? It's okay, they come and go. As the Buddhist teacher says, let the front door open, but make sure the back door is open as well. Let your thoughts come and go. As you're witnessing your thoughts, now is the time to gently introduce the mantra into the stream of your thoughts at the same energetic quality that your thoughts have. And just keep repeating the mantra, or better yet, let the mantra repeat itself. And you're not going to push away the thoughts. The thoughts will just naturally recede as you focus on the mantra repeating itself. If you get lost in thoughts, that's okay. Just reintroduce the mantra. Keep repeating it silently. Don't worry about the time. We'll, we'll meditate only for about two or about three minutes. I'll let you know when it's time to stop meditating. Have a nice short meditation.
Okay, if you could gently come back into this space, wiggle your toes, your hands, gently open your eyes, slowly open your eyes. It's a shorter meditation than I normally like to do, but like I said, I'm 73, <laughs> got a lot of ground to cover. So I'll begin. My name's Tom Taylor. I'm on a path of discovery and recovery. The name of the, the topic is darkness to light. As I was thinking about this, I recalled what to say. I recalled, I, was, I can't remember the novelist, but, but I think of the novelist who said that life makes much more sense looking backwards than it does uh, living up. Uh, of course, the corollary to that is that you can only live life in the present, but uh, but it does make sense, especially when I'm looking at my addiction and sobriety. And when I look back on it, moving from sobriety to uh, moving from addiction to sobriety, it is moving from darkness to light. And I like to think of it. I'm going to talk about three different three different stages. There was the stage of dark of, of darkness or complete darkness when it comes to addiction of of my alcohol addiction that that it, that got worse and worse and worse over a long period of time. Then there's a stage after between rehab and the last relapse that, and I'll go over these that that I considered that I was in sobriety. It was a different stage than being in in active alcohol addiction. It wasn't complete darkness. Most of the time I was. I was sober during those six years from 2009 to 2015, but I was, um, uh, I was relapsing. And so that brings us to the third stage um, after meeting Tommy of uh, the relapse ending and going from finally into, into light and, uh, and, and enjoying sobriety for the last six years. June 6, 2015 is my sobriety day. So the earliest I can remember, I grew up in Texas, um, grew up in Dallas, really, went to an elite prep school, an all-boys prep school, um, I had a, a normal childhood, I had, as Tommy likes to say, my gateway drug was sugar, I remember as a kid, we had Pepsis and Cokes and ice cream all the time without even thinking about it. But the main thing I remember all the way through, through, especially through the prep school I went to, and even through college into my 20s, is I always felt like I was in a fog. I always felt like I really didn't know. I felt like I didn't belong. I wasn't, I wasn't, wasn't really part of anything. I felt detached, um, not engaged. Uh, I don't know how to describe it other than that. Um, I was actually totally unconscious of, of, of what I was doing. I was, I was living totally karmically uh, without, any, without any much of any awareness going on. And uh, when I went to college, I went to university in the, um, in the well, I, I actually went to university, University of Texas. I actually spent the summer of 2000, of 1967, I kind of showed you how old I was when I was 19, traveling around Europe, I became a hippie. And I, the one thing that I did do a lot in my teens, back in high school, going through college, and especially when I was in Europe, is I just, I read a lot, a lot of Buddhist and Indian books. Um, the Bhagavad Gita, the Yoga Sutras, books like that. I didn't understand them at all, but for some reason I was extremely drawn to them. And I read them. Um, and I remember when I was in Europe, 1967, I read Aldous Huxley's um, The Doors of Perception and decided that that, that that might be the key to understanding what I was reading to, to take drugs, psychedelics, which the book is about. So when I got back from Europe and went and came back to Austin, I, I, um, I started taking, I started a, a slow ascent or descent into uh, marijuana and psychedelics. 
And by the early 70s, I was uh, married, but I was a, a full-blown hippie. Uh, I smoked weed every single day. Eventually, it moved from being a, um, a, a, a drug that opened up my mind, which it did do. It was extremely useful in that respect. It showed me a different reality, but then it became a way of medicating myself. And uh, I was in and out of graduate school. I worked in the university bookstore. And that, I, and looking back, I worked on it because it's so easy to be stoned and working in the bookstore. All we did was put books on the shelves, take them off, put more books on the shelves. So I was able to do that. Everyone that worked with me was stoned all day long. So I would literally get up in the morning, smoke a little bit of a joint, um, smoke weed during lunch with everyone else. We'd smoke out in the alley behind the bookstore um, and basically stayed, stayed stoned all the time. Somehow during uh, about the time that I turned 26 or 27, um, I was still in graduate school and I read a book, uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald's Tender as a Night. And one of the main protagonists in it was talking about, yeah, the 60s after all. One of the protagonists was talking about how they partied. This was during the roaring 20s, by the way, and how they partied, this person partied until he turned 30. And then when he turned 30, he decided it was time to stop partying and he got serious about making money. That stuck with me. And so when I turned 27, I was kind of tired of being a hippie. I was, I was poor, even though I was enjoying my lifestyle quite a bit. It was Austin, Texas, and I got into a lot of, um, uh, I had family that was in, that were musicians, and I never had to pay to go to a concert. I always got in for free. Um, but I got tired of that. I got tired of not having any money. And so I decided to get a little serious. And I kept, still was interested in, in Buddhism. And, and, and um, a, a friend of mine, uh, who I worked with the, at the bookstore had, had a friend who was a biology professor at the University of Texas, Neil Carmen was his name, who was a big time meditator. And she introduced us and he got me into meditation into TM and he coached me for the first several months of meditation. And so that was 46 years ago. And I'm going to say, and looking back on all this thing about this, it was, um, it was one of the three most important things I've done in my life in terms of my own spiritual evolution. And I've meditated twice a day, every day since then, even when I was drinking heavily. I've probably missed, I don't know exactly how many times, but not any more than 10 or 15 times in the 46 years. And I haven't missed any meditation since uh, session since I've been sober, since, since uh, certainly since um, I was in rehab in 2009. So it was um, that. It was a lifesaver for me, both in my addiction and, and post-addiction. And I, I think it makes my story a little different in that even when I was drinking, I was meditating. So I was kind of spiritually evolving, although the alcohol retarded the spiritual evolution, if that makes sense. Then I finished, I chopped off my hair. <laughs> A group of friends of mine went with me to a, a woman that we that we that we all knew that was a friend of ours who who owned her own. She was a hairstylist. She tried to talk me out of chopping off my hair, but we talked her into. She chopped off. I chopped off my hair. Went back to graduate school. Got my master's uh, in English literature. Uh, went with my wife. We moved to Dallas. I taught at a community college for a year. Um, we didn't like living in Dallas, so we moved back to Austin. And I was looking for a job. I ended up in academic publishing. Basically, it's how I spent the next 40 years of my life work-wise. I was in uh, work for various publishing companies. First one I worked for for 17 years as a salesperson, as a marketing manager, as an editor. And I worked my way up and um, it became pretty successful for the last 20 years. I was in senior management. But how that affects my drug choice is that I moved from weed uh, to alcohol. Weed did not lend itself to being a career oriented, climbing up the ladder publishing person, but alcohol did. So I started drinking and, and 
about three or four or five years into into publishing, the weed was almost practically gone, and I I didn't use that, and I but I kept drinking a little bit more and more and more every year. Interestingly enough, during that time frame, uh, meditation would actually sober me up. And there was a typical scenario where I'd get on an airplane flight to a meeting. By the way, alcohol became alcohol and airplanes were perfectly associated for me. And I I would uh, get on an airplane, fly to a meeting, a, a week long meeting. Was drunk when I got to the um, to wherever the meeting was. Got to the hotel room, sat down, did my afternoon meditation. That actually sobered me up. Meditation would sober me up enough to go to a meeting and speak and, and interact in a rational way. So it was an interesting aspect of meditation that would, it would do that for me and, and it would help me. Um, to, to cut that part short, I became a functional alcoholic so that the, the, the usual, by the, by the 2000s, I was living in California. I was executive vice president of sales and marketing for a publishing company. Uh, we did scientific journals. The typical day during the week, I would uh, wake up with a hangover. I'd have a glass of, glass of wine at lunch. I would, would meditate in the afternoon. I'd go home, have three or four glasses of scotch, split a bottle of wine with my wife, drink more scotch, get up in the morning, do it all over again. On the weekend, I would spend the weekend drunk. I would go to breakfast, have several um, champagnes or mimosas and drink all day, all day long. It got to a point where by 2009, um, all right, my wife was also in publishing and she would travel internationally sometimes. We're both into international uh, jobs that required us to do international travel. I got to the last, the last year in 2009, when she was gone for a week, I would binge drink so that I was drunk the whole time. I'd call in sick. She came home from a trip in the middle, last latter part of July, 2009. I'd been binge drinking all week. Um, I was sick. I'd be waking in the morning sick. The irony, I'm sure some of you can relate to this, I was, um, I never associated being sick with, um, with my, with drinking. I wondered why I was sick and I, <laughs> after all, I was in darkness still, I was unconscious. And, um, I was so worried about being sick that I, I, uh, I had found a doctor by the way, who, um, this is fits into Tommy's, uh, weirdness journal thing who, had an office who had a practice that was actually next door to the house that I lived in. And, um, and he was uh, not a normal doctor. He had a very, he was highly credentialed uh, first in his class, or I gotta be good friends with him. That's how I know all this. With his medical degree at Duke, had a practice in Washington, DC, um, then met a guru and closed down his practice, moved to India and lived in an ashram for 10 years at his guru's ashram. His guru moved from India to California and the doctor and two other doctors that were in the ashram moved to California with a guru and formed this practice where they tried to integrate um, alternative forms of medicine along with the medical practice they were doing. And he just happened to be next door to me. And he kind of, knew what he knew that I had a problem long before I did and he became with he became an integral part an important part of my eventual sobriety so at any rate when I went to him and 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 said that I was sick I thought I was going to die he said I wasn't going to die but he put me through two days of test of tests um and remarkably enough I was I was okay so at any rate, when I came, I, my wife came back in, in, in July from, the, from a trip to the Middle East and I was really sick and we didn't know what to do. I mean, I, I couldn't get out of bed. I was having dry heaves. Um, my wife called up my um, daughter who happened to be a nurse and daughter said, get a, call an ambulance, send him to a hospital. They'll have to take him in. And I ended up five days in detox 
which was the worst, um, literally the worst five days of my life. There was never a five days that was worse than that. I thought there was a person in the detox room with me. I literally thought he was trying to kill me. I was hallucinating the whole time. Not good hallucinations, bad hallucinations. After detox, I came out and I, the doctor came and visited me. My wife called him up. He had connections with people at a rehab facility um, called Passages. Some of you may know it. It's a little controversial. Um, it's in Malibu, California. Akadama, who wasn't there at the time, who is part of R2O, uh, worked there after I left for, I don't know, quite a few years as a spiritual teacher. But I was out of detox on a Friday. By that Sunday morning, I was in Passages, and I spent the month of August 2009 in Passages. And that was the second most, that was the second transformational event in my life that totally changed me. I remember telling people after I got out that everyone should go to rehab, whether they need, whether they are in addiction or not, because it was so life transformational. I got out of, um, during the month, I, I remember uh, two things. I remember they, they would take us out on field trips. And I remember, as in Malibu, I remember being in the car and looking at the waves of the ocean and looking how the energy was just coming out of the waves. And that's that's what I used to be able to see before I started drinking, when I first started meditating. And I remember thinking and writing my journal, ah, it's back. I can see what I, what I haven't been able to see for a long, long time. Hence, moving from darkness into light. The other thing that happened that became really huge in me, if you, any of you that follow me on, on Instagram know that my, my handle is Tom Dragonfly. The companies I started have been called Dragonfly. There was a spiritual teacher there who took me out to, at Passages. It took me out to on the beach. We actually found a secluded beach in Malibu. And he guided me through a meditation. We meditated, I don't know how long, 20 or 30 minutes. It was one of the deepest meditations I've ever had. It was actually... I was, um, I could see my third eye. I didn't at the time think that I was looking at my third eye. I just was experiencing this bright light in the middle of my forehead. But I was, I was look, I, but that's, then looking back, that's what it was. Came out of it and I went, wow. I said, thank you to the teacher. I said, that, that, that was just an amazing experience. Thank you for doing this. And he said, well, I don't know what you want to think about this, but for at least 15 or 20 minutes while you're meditating, a dragonfly was circling over the top of your head. So you should go back and look it up when you get back to the to the to your room at the rehab center and passages. So I looked it up. Interestingly enough, dragonflies in Asian culture and in Native American culture uh, basically mean the same thing. They mean new beginnings, fresh starts re re beginning restarting your life and so i said okay um oh another thing that i that, that one of part of the transformation at passages is i knew i could no longer work in a corporate environment i don't have time to go into what that was all about i just knew i could not work in the corporate environment that i've been working in for 40 years anymore so i knew in the august of 2009 that i was going to start up my own company after that session with the with the meditation teacher, I knew that Dragonfly was going to be in its name. So henceforth, I, when I started up a publishing company several months later, a publishing sales company, several months later, I called it Dragonfly Sales and Marketing. And my um, I incorporated a teach meditation and do recovery coaching. It's called it Dragonfly Rising. Anyway, I left I left rehab, and uh, that was August to spent the month of August, 2009 in rehab, left it, started up my own company. We moved to New Jersey and then to um, Raleigh, North Carolina, where I live. So that was the first, the first phase was, was the darkness. And then from 2009 to 2015, I'm in partial lightness. And I would relapse about once every, anywhere from once every two months to once every seven months. I think the seven, maybe eight months is the longest I went without drinking and normally when the relapse will last from three days to a week um the biggest the the 
some of them were spectacular. The, the, the generic, I traveled at my own company was I, I represented clients um, who published scientific journals. I represented them uh, selling their digital content to groups of library, university libraries and medical libraries around the world. And I contracted out with, with, um, with indigenous sales groups in those countries. So I would go to different countries as part of my company's job. And I went every year, uh, go every year to China, every year to Australia, several times a year to Europe. And the default was that sometimes I would, or often I would get to the airport, I would start drinking in the lounge and I would drink. That's when I would relapse. And then I would get upgraded to first class since I was on the airplanes a lot. And they would give you free drinks. I would drink. By the time I got to wherever I was going, I was drunk. And some of them, I would stay drunk for the whole time. So it was kind of a wasted trip. Um, two or three times I got where I had to be rescued. My wife had to call up the hotel where I was staying at. They would come get me. Since I was in London, they packed my suitcases for me, um, put me in a shower. Embarrassing, obviously. Uh, hired someone to take me to the airport and walk me through custom, uh, walk me through um, well, customs or border control, and I'd get back, and I would go through a week to two week long process of detox. I used to joke that I should write a book on how to detox since I um, became such an expert in it. I was still meditating in two thousand and. Um, By 2000, well, let me let me jump forward to the last drink. And in the summer of two, in June 2015, I had one of these trips, and I went to China, and um, was drunk the whole time. And I, when I got back to the states, I remember thinking that, um, and the detox was particularly painful then. I remember thinking. Or remember knowing inside of myself, this is the last one. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not drinking anymore. That was June sixth, two thousand fifteen. Somehow I just knew. I could. I couldn't tell my wife how I knew, or why I thought I was not drinking, but but I just. I just knew. And um, enter Tommy in recovery two point zero. So I first met Tommy. In 2012, I was I was um, all those years of meditating, and I was like I say, I'd been I'd been out of rehab for several years, so most of the time I was sober. 95 percent of the time I was sober, and so I wanted to find something that would combine meditation and recovery, and that they had I thought there had to be a community of people that meditated and, and were in recovery, and so I went to I, I googled that, and on the internet I found. Um, and I was familiar with the Omega Institute. Actually, that's the way it worked. I was familiar with the Omega Institute. So I went to the Omega Institute. It's a retreat center, my favorite retreat center. It's in Upper State, New York, Rhinebeck. Um, and um, I know I saw on there that that appearing at, at for a retreat at the Omega Institute was Tommy Rosen, and it wasn't meditation and recovery, but it was yoga and recovery. And I thought, well, that's close enough. So I signed up for that. And it was my first, it was a, it was a 2012, the book, his book hadn't come out yet. It was only three days, but that was my introdu introduction to Tommy and Kia was there as well. I was horrible at, at doing the yoga. I, I, I felt like a total klutz, as most of you, as some of you might. Uh, but there's something, there was a connection there. And so over the years, I kind of, I kind of got more started following Tommy more and more and more. And so fast forward to summer of 2015, June 6, 2015, I'm back. By the end of June, I'm, I'm, um, I've gone through detox. Tommy has what he called, I don't know what he calls them now, but they're these six weeks programs. He called them the coaching programs then. And, um, and he had one in mid or late summer 2015. And I signed up for it. I went through it. And that was the missing link. That's what I think that was the thing that 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 got me sober, that that ended the 
the cycle of relapses. And what it was, was uh, I think what was there that I hadn't had before was community. Um, well, there were practices. I, I became very interested in Kundalini yoga and, and practiced that ever since. Uh, the Kriyas, there was nutrition. I, I incorporate all the stuff that is an R2O. But I think what was an important thing that kept me sober then was the community and the people I met, many of whom I consider my closest friends now. Uh, there are people that I've met in R2O that I'm far closer to with deeper relationships with my normal everyday friends or even my family. There were some people there there was, a, there was a woman in particular that I've never met in person, but we got to um, connect online. And I would call her, call her when I felt like I might start drinking. And I remember, um, once again, I'm in publishing, the largest publishing event in the world is the Frankfurt Book Fair. Tens of thousands of people go to it from all over the world. And I had to go, I went every year for 25 years. I went, and on the way, I just knew I was going to start drinking. So I, I called this woman um, from the airport. She and I was on the phone with her. When I walked into the airport in the airline lounge, and I was on the phone with her as I walked into the airplane, I'd been upgraded. And with her still on the phone, I told the flight attendant, by the, I told the flight attendant, I'm in recovery. I would like it if you didn't offer me any drinks. And at that moment, I knew that I was never going to have a drink again. So that was the missing link. Um, let's see. So I was in, I was in, um, that was the third phase. From June 6th until the present, I haven't touched recreational drugs or alcohol. Uh, stop drinking coffee. Um, don't drink black tea. I drink, I drink oolong tea and green tea. That's, that's probably the extent of the drugs that I take. Um, one other thing I want to talk about, or two other things real quickly, and then we'll open up for questions. There was an event about two years into, the, into that sobriety, um, two and a half years. Uh, I'll just go through this quickly, but it was, it was extremely important. In December 2017, my wife uh, was in the hospital with uh, pneumonia. And she was there for a week and she had pneumonia for three or four months. And there was a 24 hour period where we actually thought she might die. Uh, but she got out of it. And, but that was traumatic. Also in the fall of 2017, I'd, I'd gotten a business partner in 2015 in my business. And he had his half of the world. I had my half of the world. And in December, 2017, I found out he's a very nice guy. I don't mean to disparage him, but he had screwed up his part of the world so that he ended up paying out more money they were taking in. Uh, it was a huge mistake. Uh, our business was on thin margins, but I knew that I was gonna have to do something to make it right. And furthermore, in December 2017, he told me he was quitting. He couldn't do it any longer. He still owned a third of the company, but he was gonna go work for another company in January 2018, the next month. At another element in October 2017, I got my Chopra, Deepak Chopra teacher certification to um, teach meditation. I'd been doing that for two years and I really wanted to stop um, doing my business and, um, and do full time meditation teaching. Then, and, um, and with all that caused, by January 2018, I was in the frequency of addiction. Um, I was couldn't sleep at night. I was craving. It's the only time I was craving. But the interesting thing is that when I literally imagined the taste of alcohol, it was repulsive, and I didn't. I couldn't drink, but I had the craving. It was interesting. And then in January 2018, I went to my first in-person retreat since the one in 2012 with Tommy, or the Joshua Tree, I met many of the people who I got to be friends with in R2O. I knew that that retreat, an epiphany happened that was at, towards the end, I think, of January, middle January, end of January 2019. I knew that I was going to, that I needed to get rid of my company, however, whatever it took, and I knew that I needed to do 
to do this met to do the meditation. So I spent 2018. I ended up going to four retreats in total with Tommy. Um, the Kripala one in May, July, in um, at Art of Living Center, and where we met Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, and then. The third transformational event was in India in October and November of 2018, where I got yoga teacher training with Kia and Tommy. And that just changed, changed everything. That just, that I, I can't explain it, except that it just totally trans, me, meditation, spirituality from that moment on became the centerpiece of my life. So, um, That, in, in one way, was the fulfillment of the promise of recovery 2.0, that from that moment on, I've, I've, it's not that I don't have challenges and I don't get stressed and I don't get irritated, but there's a constant underlying state of contentment. Um, I can't describe it except to say there's a state of, content, a, a state of mind of contentment, and then on top of it, there may be challenges. There may be someone. There may be someone ask me to do something I can't do. With you know what they are. It's just those those challenges don't don't take over me. They don't take over my emotions. They don't take over my mind because I'm feel this. I'm established in this. It's very subtle, but it's constantly there. This 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 state of contentment. Um. There's a lot more I could say, but I, I, I think that's, um, that's, that's basically it. I've, since then, I've become a coach. Oh, I became, in, in September 2019, I became a recovery coach, certified recovery coach with Tommy, along with 39, I think, other people. And, um, and so I've been doing that and teaching meditation and, um, and dealing with the challenges of life. Since then, I, I will add something about COVID. I'm not going to tell you where I stand, although some of you know, I mean, I'm on vaccines. But to me, more important than whether you're pro-vaccine or anti-vaccine, more important for me is that since people have really strong opinions about this, as I do, it's been a tremendous spiritual exercise for me to relate to people um, and love while at the same time being able to express my opinion. I know where I stand, they know where they stand. And we relate and underneath that, we relate to each other, knowing that our thoughts and our beliefs are not as real as the love we feel for each other. I hope that makes sense. But in some ways, COVID is a blessing in that respect, in that respect, in that it's allowed, it's created an opportunity for a spiritual exercise for growth. Okay, I talked longer than I really wanted to. So, um, so if you feel like it, join me in the Recovery 2.0 prayer. Universe, put me in the places you want me to be with the people you want me to be with, doing the things you want me to do. Thank you for the joys and challenges of my life. Amen, namaste, sat nam, woohoo. I don't do the woohoo that well, but thank you guys. Take care.